dear participants today i will be discussing a very important paper and this paper is about a topic which is very very important in the field of natural resource management or we could say for any kind of resource management and that is social capital and collective management of resources by Jules Pretty. Jules Pretty is very well known researcher in the field of natural resources management. And this particular topic social capital, if you recall that in one of the previous lectures, I have discussed with you about various capital which are actually important for natural resource management, human capital, social capital, right? Remember, there are five capitals that I discussed with you. Now, among these, the human resource capital, social capital, these two are actually, you know, critically important for natural resource management. And by now, all of you are I believe well aware of the fact that natural resource management is best carried forward by the people, by the community, by the people, individuals who live among those resources. They can be the best, you know, managers for these resources. And those people, those community are considered as social capital. Of course, you and me also part of that social capital, but the people, the community who are actually living with those resources are one of the most important component of social capital. And this paper particularly Dr. Jules Pretty has very, very nicely, lucidly elaborated and today we will discuss on this paper and this will clarify or this will make all of us actually understand the importance of social capital and collective management and how actually it takes place, what are the different aspects involved in that. If you see that in this paper, Dr. Jules Pretty has again once again started with Malthus, Malthus theory. He mentioned in this paper that Malthus through Hardin and beyond. You remember Garrett Hardin, we have already discussed that paper. They have analyzed, they have also, you know, discussed about these issues and it has been found that somehow all these people have widely come to accept that natural resources need to be protected from the destructive yet apparently rational actions of people. But the logic, the logic behind this that the people at the end of a day is going to harm the natural resources as they use for their benefit. And more people therefore will make more harm to the natural resources. All right. And I think we have discussed it in quite great detail when I was discussing Garrett Hardin papers with you. The likelihood of this damage is greater when natural resources are commonly owned is further increased by suspicions that people tend to go for free ride. They think these resources are free, so they start overusing it and under investing in the maintenance of those resources. The reason is that those resources are not owned by them. It is free, common. So, they end up sometime overusing. Now, as the you know population increase and in evidence of you know detrimental effect towards various resources like water, land, atmosphere is very, very clear to us and we also see that there is the option that is left for us that either we regulate to prevent this indiscriminate use of natural resources. And if you recall that in Hardin words, Hardin said 
that to engage in mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon or we press ahead with enclosure and privatization to increase the likelihood that resources will be more carefully managed. Now, this is to a large number of people is a very, very sensitive statement. But if you look into this and if you look into this aspect through the eyes of the authors, the researcher, probably you could be able to see the other side of this fact, what actually authors says here. Because the author is very much concerned about the resources and it is clearly visible, anything free available to us even today, we end up misusing it, we end up over consuming anything which is free that not only harms us, but also take away the resources from the system which probably another person could have used. Now, here the issue of collective management comes in. One individual, one individual organization cannot help. Each one of us has a role to play. If I over consume because it is free, that is a human tendency. Anything say food or cloth or anything that you provide and if you say free, then people tends to consume it extra. Probably that extra is not required for his well-being, rather it can harm his body, health. But in doing so, what he is doing? He is taking that food which probably another person could have eaten or any other resources. All right. So, if we now look at the other aspect of this particular you know paper, you will see that that the author is actually trying to focus on social capital and collective management to avoid this great harm of over consuming, over utilizing resources, underestimating the value of the resources. So, this paper from that point of view is very important. So, in this paper, uh, the author Jules Pretty actually ask an important question and he asks the could local people play a positive role in conservation and management of resources and if it is yes, then how best can unfettered private actions be mediated in favor of the common good. Can we have the private actions for the betterment of common good? Now, these are very critical questions. You will find that though some communities have long been known to manage common resources, such as forest, we know that in northeast and many parts of our country, the tribal people, the indigenous people are anyway taking care of their forest and other natural resources. But the problem starts when your population increase, demand increases, aspiration also increases, then there is an issue and that requires collective management. Now, forest, management of forest, grazing lands effectively over a period of time. So, all these issues are actually important for you know regulating the resource uses. Now, the question is that whether you will leave it to the local people solely to maintain or you want to bring in strict regulation or enclosure. You remember that in Garrett Hardin paper when we were discussing, we discussed about that. That in some cases, government can, can and regulate it through making you know uh, reserve forest, uh, national park. So, in that case, what happened? The entry of the indigenous people get restricted, government takes care of that area. Now, the, the social dynamics of the indigenous people who live with the forest from centuries. Now, there is a break in that social dynamics, very, very sensitive, but the issue is that whether you would like to leave it to the indigenous people completely or we want to uh, advise government to take it over and make it restricted region. Now, this particular aspect if you recall, uh, you know I discussed in great detail the plus and the minus aspect of these two uh, management path. 
Now, here also Jules Pretty talks about that. He says then, there is another way, third way, which has been shaped by theoretical developments in the governance of the commons, means commons properties, or common resources and thinking on the social capital. Now, means people. Now, these groups, these groups, they are indicating that with a good knowledge about local resources, appropriate institutions, social and economic conditions, processes that can encourage careful deliberations, where communities can work together collectively to use natural resources in a sustainable manner over a long period of time, things can be better. Now, having said that, to bring these things into practice is not easy. One has to, you know, work with a long time with the community. Now, look at the aspect of social capital and local resource management groups. If you recall that we talked about when we were talking about watershed management, we discussed about water user group, right? So, the term social capital, it captures the idea that social bonds and norms are important for people and communities. You cannot keep the natural resources and the communities separate and in isolation. They both are very integral part of the ecosystem. If you want it happen in a sustainable manner, then this integration of people and natural resources is very, very important. Now, Jules Pretty says that, if, that it emerged as a term after detailed analysis of the effects of social cohesion on regional income, civil society and life expectancy. This terminology has come into existence. Social capital, as he writes here that it lowers the transaction cost of working together. It also facilitates cooperation. People have the confidence to actually invest in collective activities knowing that others will also do so. If I go, my family go for preserving natural resources in a village, I hope I go with that feeling that probably my neighbor also will do that. That is the kind of social capital that he is talking here. He believes that the entire you know community there, if one person, one home goes, they are also you know will be attracted to do that. But he feels that this community probably may not be very keen in engaging private actions with some negative outcomes or resource degradation. Private actions could be utilization of natural resources, using those resources to develop some products or something. So, the community, local community may feel that those are not a very good option and could actually destroy the resource base. So, here four features Jules Pretty thinks are very, very important. Relation of trust, mutual trust, norms, reciprocity and exchanges among people, common rules, norms and sanctions, connectedness in networks and groups. So, these are very, very important point if you want your natural resources to be maintained in a sustainable manner. The trust, there is a deficit of trust among the indigenous people and sometimes also with government reference stakeholders. The trust among these two communities are lacking and that could be uh, one you know hurdle for sustainable natural resource management. So, the relation of trust Transjunction of idea, thoughts, exchange of opinion, these are critical. So, Jules also says that instead of having to invest in monitoring others, individuals are able to trust them to act as expected, thus saving money and time. Here he says that if we trust each other, then we do not need to monitor each other. So, there is there is you know you can avoid lot of expenditure of monitoring someone also you can save lot of time 
Okay? He also says, Jules Pretty says, common rules, norms and sanctions are mutually agreed upon or handed down drivers of behavior that ensure group interest and complementary with those of individuals. And sometimes these are called as rules of the game. Okay? And these things give an individual confidence to invest in the collective good. Otherwise, every individual you know thinks, why should I invest my money for preserving resource which is no one's? Why should I give money? But once there is a trust and once there is a common rules among the community, understanding is there when they learn to understand that these resources if it is saved, it is going to serve entire community, not only one individual. At that level of confidence when comes in, then you will see that a collective good is going to take place. And this is a wonderful, you know, social capital, social dynamics, which can encourage the better natural resource management. Next, uh, another point that I would like to, you know, bring in front of you and also highlight is the collective resource management programs that seek to build trust, develop new norms, help to form groups and these programs are you know described by the terms community, participatory, joint like joint forest you know program, joint forest management decentralized this kind of terminology co-management you are hearing these days right everybody talks about participatory natural resource management joint forest management decentralized resource management co-management of forest like that so this terminology actually is coming from the concept of collective resource management program which jules pretty writes here in this paper now it has been also found that these things have been effective in several sectors including your watershed, forest, irrigation, paste, wildlife, fishery, farmers research, microfinance management everywhere. Because wherever people and social capital is involved, collective resource management is the key to success because it talks about a collective actions to address a problem. Since early 1990s, somewhere around 400,000 to 500,000 new local groups has were established in varying environmental and social context in across country that Jules was talking in this particular paper. And he, re he reports that the majority of them continue to successful and show the inclusive characteristics. So, the inclusiveness, collective action is the key for successful natural resource management. That is what coming again and again from every paragraph in this particular article. So, there are positive ecological and economic outcome also has been reported here. And then you find that not only you know only water, but forest, paste management, you know wildlife, fishery, almost every, every field of natural resource management can be actually successfully sustainably managed provided we take care of these things social capital and collective management. So, having said that Jules Pretty also in this article brings in or forecast few challenges. Okay? What are those? The formation, the persistence and effects of new groups like I said no water resource groups suppose forest management groups. So, these groups suggest the formation persistence of these groups suggest that new configuration of social and human relation could be prerequisite for long term improvements in natural resources. Okay? So, this all actually hints towards that. 
Now, the regulations and the economic incentives also play a very important role in encouraging you know these changes in people behavior and they can also change their practice. Having said that Jules also say that there is actually no guaranteed positive effect on personal attitudes though. He says that all these good things can happen, but it is very very difficult to guarantee that somebody some person's individual attitude can also be changed. So, that he says he cannot guarantee it because the collective action still can be you know brought in and, and can be energized, but sometimes individual attitude characteristics to modify and change is difficult. So, that cannot be guaranteed. Without the changes in social norms, people often revert to old ways of their practice. Means, you cut it, you use it and forget it. So, without changes in social norms, people community has a chance that they will go back to their old ways of lifestyle. When incentives end, suppose government is some incentives to restore natural resources, if that ends, if suppose regulation are no longer enforced and so no long term protection may be compromised. Now, what happen is that when suppose government decides that okay, this strict regulation we are removing that is one and then suppose your social norms which you developed with time you are not changing modifying it as per the demand of time. What happen is that the people will tend to go back to that time when there was no regulation nothing free. All resources are free use it as much as possible. So, there is a chance that they may go back. So, this is critical that uh, Jules pointed out here, but he says that however, he says there remains a danger of appearing too optimistic about local group and their capacity to deliver economic and environmental benefits. So, he also says gives an warning that we should not be too much optimistic on the local groups because divisions within and between communities can result in environmental damage as well. And people who have worked in the community level at the ground level, grassroots level, you know it what Jules Pretty is talking about here. There could be few divisions within the community and they might because of that division they might actually create some negative effect on the resources. And that is something that you know one needs to take care of. He also says not all forms of social relations are necessarily good for everyone. A society may have strong institutions and enable reciprocal mechanisms yet be based on fear and power such as feudal and unjust societies. Okay? So, he also goes on say that some associations may can act as obstacles to the emergence of sustainability and encouraging conformity, perpetuating equality and allowing certain individuals to shape their institution to suit only themselves. Very, very strong statement. So, in this case social capital can also have its dark side that is what Jules bring in. Social capital can help to ensure compliance with the rules, can keep down monitoring costs, provided networks are very good and with frequent communication and reciprocal arrangement, small group size, lack of easy exit options for members. So, these are certain points that need to be looked at. However, there are factors relating to the natural resources themselves, particularly whether you know they are stationary or have high storage capacity, clear boundaries and those things can also play a critical role in affecting whether 
social groups can be successful in their endeavor to manage natural resources, keeping down the cost of enforcement, ensure positive resource outcomes. Finally, Jules went on to say that communities do not always have the knowledge to appreciate that what they are doing may be harmful. This is again a very, very important observation. Communities do not always have the knowledge to appreciate the fact that they are also doing some harm to the natural resources. As an example, fishing. Fishing communities to believe that fish stocks are not being eroded even though the scientific evidence indicates otherwise. They believe they are fishing daily, 24 by 7, 30 days in a month they are fishing, but still they feel that fish stocks are not going down. So, that kind of you know feeling can be dangerous for sustainable natural resource management even at the community level. Local groups you know may need the support of higher level authorities, for example, with legal structures that which can give them enough legal structures to the communities, clear entitlement to land and other resources as well as some protection from the pressures of global market. For global environmental problems such as uh, we talk about climate change, governments may need to regulate because no community feels that it can have a perceptible impact on a global problem. That is the very common thinking that you will find. So, Jules says here that effective international institutions are needed to complement the local ones which are on the ground. At the end, he says that the ideas of social capital and governance of the commons combined with the recent successes of various local groups perhaps offer the roads for constructive and sustainable outcomes from natural resources in many parts of the world ecosystem. But till date, the team ups of the commons have been largely at local to the regional level, where resources can be closed access and where institutional conditions and market pressures are also supporting. The greater challenge will center on applying some of these principles to open access commons and worldwide environmental threats and creating the condition by which social capital can work under growing economic globalizations. Now, that kind of system to that kind of ecosystem to visualize is really great. So, let us hope that the world will actually you know look like this the way Jules Pretty here hope to see and if that happens then I think that management of natural resources with the help of social capital and following the collective management of resources will be a very successful one and the natural resource management will be ensured for the benefit of the society and also for the environment. Mm -hmm.